So brilliant idea, brilliant co- uh, idea, uh, concept. Um, the execution of it was flawed by kind of the enemy within. What I'd been recruited for and what the reality was that was staring me in the face were very, very different. They planned, they took bold steps, they owned that process. It was, it was be- beautiful to watch. There was someone like 40 of us on the training course. I mean, at, at the end of the first week, so I won't want say it's like the SAS, but five people just left the company. They didn't, they didn't survive the first week basically told yeah give us your car keys and uh you know you had these people stood in car parks with baby seats and stuff like that that in the boot of the car this is the leeds business podcast and i'm your host phil fraser this week we speak to mark fitzgerald cook md of intelligent business partners mark tells us all about the difficulties in moving from print to online all about a great business idea that didn't work and how owning the process gives you power in a sector. The business surgery answers the question, I'm currently doing my business planning. How far in advance should I do my strategy? Before we start, I have one simple request. Please hit the follow or subscribe button on the app that you're listening on. That's it, thank you. So, let's get into what is a really fast-moving episode. On today's Leeds Business Podcast, I'm delighted to have as my guest, Mark Fitzgerald Cook, MD of Intelligent Business Partners. Mark, good morning. Good morning, Phil. Now, quick first question for you. In your career, have you ever taken private equity? Yes, we have. Right. Okay. Well, we might get into that uh, a bit later on. But first, the reason I ask is today's podcast is brought to you in association with Leeds-based YFM Equity Partners. YFM Equity Partners offer investments from two to 15 million pounds, specifically to fast growing businesses, as well as providing the resources and expertise needed to take your business to the next level. So if you're an entrepreneur with a vision for growth, whether you're expanding your market or scaling operations, YFM Equity Partners can help you turn your ambitions for your business into a reality. Now, interestingly, I'm not just plugging YFM for no reason. They've actually partnered with uh, Pan Intelligence, whose founder, whose co-founder, Zandra Moore, was my guest on episode 23, where one of the things we actually discussed was her experiences in looking for and finding private equity. So uh, have a look at that episode or have a listen to that episode and hear what she says about YFM. So if you're looking for a partner with a team that believes in your potential, you can find out more at yfmep.com. That address is also at the top of the show notes. And when you do contact YFM, make sure you tell them that Phil from Leeds Business Podcast sent you. So there we go. So Mark, you have had a very varied and uh, international uh, career, which I'm I'm fascinated to get stuck into. Um, let's go back to TNT Magazine, and which was part of Auto Trader. Uh, how did you get there, and what did you do? Okay, right. Flashbacks. It's like being in Vietnam, Phil. If you weren't there, you don't know. Um, uh, quick, quick note on your sponsor, Phil, to get us going is we actually have some dealings with them in our day to day job and find them to be a really good, highly credible business that we've had some experiences with as well. So just a, as a short aside there. Great stuff. T- TNT Magazine. Um, yes, it's been varied. Yes, it's been international. Yes, I've done different things. Uh, the underpinning thing is I've put buyers and sellers together in all my roles since I was about 17, working in classified local press, selling ad space like you did back in the day yourself. Um, so that, that's underpinned everything. There have been some various bits on the, on, on the top. Um, TNT Magazine were is uh, was back then, it was the biggest free magazine in the world. Anyone who had worked in London or over in Sydney, Australia, possibly Manchester, would have come out the railway stations and would have seen all these bins with different free magazines you could pick up aimed at the uh, the, the working backpacking community in, in London. It was 400 pages, 75% of it was paid for ad space, 25% of it was editorial. It was thrown off money left, right and centre. It was, it was madness. Um, how did I get there? So I had been working for Auto Trader for many years. I, at the age of 28, went traveling, backpacking, uh, just as, uh, you know, I had no responsibility. So I thought now's a good time to, to leave Trader. When I came back, uh, when I was in Thailand running out of money, Auto Trader said, hey, you back anytime soon. We've got, a, we've got a job for you. And came back and found out they bought TNT Magazine, which was a, a backpacker magazine. And luckily they had a... A, a traveling sales manager uh, in Thailand at that time. So I came back, rejoined TNT um, or joined TNT, just been acquired. 
Um, I turned up of, on my first day in a three-piece suit, very nicely cut by a man in uh, in Bangkok, and everyone else in the business was wearing board shorts and flip flops. Um, so it was uh, quite quite the cultural clash. Uh, but that's how I ended up in TNT magazine. My uh, my, my induction was. Uh, you know all about selling advertising space, which is what we need. And please don't get drunk at lunchtime. So that was the uh, that was the thank you, Barry Slatter, who was then my then boss. He was only one of uh, I think it was about three or four English people in the business, and the remaining of the eighty staff were Aussies, Kiwis, and South Africans on working holiday visas. Um, it was more about the holiday for them than the work in many cases, but they've gone on to be very successful around the world now. So that was it. That was uh, that was how we uh, how we landed at TNT Magazine. Right. Okay. It's interesting that actually because I was in London around the time you're talking, and I remember, you know, I remember those piles of bins with magazines, and and you know, as you referred to, my background was selling ad space, so I, you know, I know exactly the scene you were in, the scenario you were in, what you were doing. Um, what were the what were the main learnings for you from from that period of time? I mean, obviously, you knew how to sell space. What else did you What else did you learn from there? That's a, a really good question. Um, the, the thing I learned was that you, you can have a, a brand, let's call it for TNT magazine. So there's a brand perception and there's a brand reality. Um, now, if we advertised a job at TNT magazine, you'd get two, three, four hundred applications for a telesales job for no other basis than it was uh, it was working at TNT magazine. And and quite rightly, you know, great brand people wanted to work for it. But underneath it all, it was still a magazine with two weekly deadlines. Um, churning out, you know, 400 pages of, of copy in, in, in one title and about 120 in, in, in the midweek title. So that's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of long hours. Um, it also, uh, so th that was that was the first thing was about the fact you had to educate people coming into saying, listen, I know you th think this is going to be like a party bus, but it isn't. There's a lot of hard graft in here. Um, the other uh, lesson that came out of that was it's it's really easy to be working in a business and not on it. It's a bit of a cliche phrase, but, you know, if you've got so much business coming in, you know, it's almost you could fall into the trap of, well, it's not broke. Don't don't fix it. And one thing that came out of that was that I just sat there one day and I'm, I'm one of these people who want to go into businesses like, you know, like sit down. Right. What do you do? Like Sit down next to you. Let's have a listen. Let's have a go myself and, you know, un understand what people are about first before you would expect people to understand what, what you're thinking. And. A little bit in that environment, a little bit back in the day, a little bit alpha male type environment. You kind of had to prove that, you know, there's a reason why they should listen to you, especially with a load of strapping Aussies, Kiwis and, 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 and South Africans in there. So getting them mixed it, but it came very, very apparent very quickly. We had a huge amount of inbound business and there was one simple little thing I just said after about two weeks to people said, do us a favor. When, when people ring in, just ask them what made them call TNT today. Okay, just give that a go. And they're looking at me a bit cross-eyed as to why, why you do that. And the reason for that was when I was just listening on calls, virtually everybody rang in were people that had, they weren't in London, they weren't in the backpacker scene, but they'd heard through word of mouth that if you're in Norfolk and you're looking for some really good bar staff with hospitality experience and everything else, TNT magazine's a great place to go because they're arriving in the UK, constant flow of people looking for work. So they'd ring up and you'd be listening to people and they're going, oh, my friend did this, my friend did that. So they'd be telling us why they'd called TNT, but we, we, we weren't asking them why. And the conversion rate went through the roof. Um, went to the tune of about 200 grand's worth of revenues, I think we measured against it. Because instead of having to explain and justify our costs and everything else to people, you just simply go, what made you call us? Oh, my friend recruited and they did really well and they've got some great staff. So you'd come in because we weren't cheap uh, compared with some of the other things at the time. And so soon as somebody starts saying, oh, that's a bit more than I thought. It's like, well, as you told us, you know, your friend did a really good job, so you know it's going to work. And uh, dead simple, but just, so what was the lesson? Getting amongst it, listen to what your customers are saying, you know, and then tailor what you do to, um, to deliver what they need in the shortest possible time. So got massive buying from the staff because they were like, geez, that was easy. So the average time of phone calls went down, conversion rates went up, revenues went up. And, uh, and I think it might have been the only good idea I had for the first 18 months, but I just lived off it. So <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd, uh, I'd take that. I really like that idea that actually, if you've got any, you know, and, and this could work for anybody, you've got an inbound sales call. Why are you calling in? And you're, you're almost getting them to do the sell before 100%. you do the sell, aren't exactly you? That. That's a really, 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 exactly really clever, clever way of doing it. Well, people people love buying; they hate being sold to. So, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a 
And not, there you go. We're five minutes in. We've got two bits of learning already. Fantastic. People love buying, not, not being sold to. <laughs> okay. So how long did you stay on TNT? Until my liver said it's time to move on to another job. Um, is that, but the actual answer is, uh, is about three and a half years. Um, it, like, brilliant environment, great place, but you're working with people who are on visas. So they're coming in for two, four years. So there's a lot of rotation. The events rotated. So you, you, after a while, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we published international travel guides because we had an office out in Australia as well. We did travel events and everything else. But once you've gone through that cycle a few times, it's, it was then a little bit of what's, what am I learning here? Um, the guy who'd been my boss there had left to go and work for Fish4. He'd been on at me for 18 months to go over and, and, and join him. And I thought, that's too easy. I'm going to keep doing this, keep doing this. But after like three and a half years, it was like, listen, it's been fantastic, guys. But um, it's time to it's time to move on. But br brilliant time. Still under the auspices also of the of the Auto Trader Trader Media Group, wider business, um, who I've been with for a very long time. So yeah, time time to do something new and move into a purely online marketplace thereafter. Okay, yeah. I mean, it was interesting. I was looking at you know looking at your LinkedIn profile before we started talking, and and it said Fish Four, and I thought, bloody hell, I remember I remember them. And that's 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 early days of the internet, isn't it? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Fish four was should have been there, there. Should be no right move now. Auto trader shouldn't be doing what what it's doing now. The Fish four brand, in terms of first mover advantage of the the benefit of the potential benefit of the right people coming together at the right time. So you had four or even five. It might have been right at the very beginning of the major local press groups. So you were talking um, Daily Mail Group Trust, DMGT, you had huge amounts, Trinity Mirror Group, Northcliffe, Johnson Press. Um, one other one escapes me off, off the top of my head. Oh, Guardian Media Group, what am I about? They were guys that owned Trader Media Group who I worked for for years, those guys as well. So they, they had, I think there's, if I've got the stats right going back, they had access to 95% of the UK uh, classified press audience via their local newspaper groups. So they had, estate agent relationships, their car dealer relationships, their recruitment experience. So these are all your major classified pillars. Um, and they came together with a very simple idea of, hey, if we put all our content in, in one place, imagine how good that would be. And you could promote the brand through the local press. And it's, it's, it's the best idea on earth. Um, apart from the fact that that was online, offline, they're still all competing with each other in their print titles. And of course, you've got people deeply embedded in print magazines. They're throwing off good money. Um, so, you know, you'd, you'd have meetings, you'd be a bit like Kofi Annan, you know, with the old blue beret trying to keep the peace. So brilliant idea, brilliant concept. Um, the execution of it was flawed by kind of the enemy within uh, to, to some degree, which, you know, subsequently when I rejoined Auto Trader and they did the print digital move, you could see them execute that perfectly. Um, but it's easy with hindsight to, to look back and say, oh, you should have done this at the time. But great business, really interesting, fascinating stuff to learn. So ju just just for our listeners and, and uh, the, the younger listeners amongst us, just just explain Fish4 as, as the online concept and what sort of time we're talking. What are we around 2000, 2001? Is that right sort of timeline? Yeah, ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So was it a bit earlier? Than that? Yeah. So the sorry, explain the concept and then what you were doing and what went wrong. Yeah, sure. So um, once upon a time, you used to get a free newspaper come through your door locally. And uh, and at the front, it would have news stories and at the back, it'd have classified advertising. And everybody ignored the classified advertising unless they wanted a car, home and job. And then it became the most important thing in, 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 in the world. So what does that mean? It means you have a huge amount of content. So all the newspaper groups that had all that content, they pulled it all together and said, we should put all this online. So if somebody wants to search online for a house or a car or a home, they would have literally thousands of, of properties, cars, jobs to, to choose from. And the idea of Fish4 was to take, help the newspapers have a digital offering for their clients. Um, the challenges within that was that the people providing the collective content all, weren't all from one company. They were from they were rival firms who had rival print products that were making an awful lot of money on a local basis. And you're essentially asking people to understand that you are going to be cooperating with your traditional rival products on, on a digital version. Now, it, what went wrong was just a very simple lack of managing of the reality of, you know, of what life looks like for human beings. If I am selling ad space in a local newspaper, and let's use 
Watford, where I cut my teeth in the local press there. You've got the Watford Observer and you've got the Watford Review owned by a different firm. Well, I'm used to selling against the review and telling the whole world how awful they are. Yeah, I don't even know if the, the review's still there now. But the um, so you're asking a local press salesperson to start talking about digital. Well, if I'm in local press, my target is predicated on how much money I get for my ad spend. So I don't really want to chat about these other things. Yeah. Um, if I'm uh, uh, the managing editor and I've got all my editorial staff and I'm putting out these papers and everything else, I, I don't really get online. I don't understand the audience. I'm three years away from retirement, so someone else can sort that problem out. So it was very much the problem was the, the enemy within. You know, I, I was doing a presentation in, in Blackburn and when we were talking about user-generated content and the guy put his hand up, editorial staff, and said, that's what the letters page is for. And <laughs> he was quite right in principle you know, not, not arguing with the guy, you know, if, if, if Dolly from Blackburn's not happy about the price of milk, then good luck. She writes a letter and that's it. So the principal was there, but they were very much, you know, you can't teach us anything. We know all about it. So it was a real clash of clash of worlds. Um, they, they, and coming down to business lessons, there wasn't the right alignment top to bottom within the, um, within the wider enterprise and local level. And, and if people at the coalface don't buy into it, don't get it or don't get rewarded for it, then you can, you can write as many stroppy memos as you like from the, you know, from the CEO. It's not going to matter when John and Jane are out in front of their clients and, and what they're, they're pitching. Um, so it was a brilliant idea. It was a brilliant concept uh, with some superb people in, involved, met some absolutely fantastic people, genuine, you know, digital game changers still in the space in different capacities now with huge amounts of experience. Um, but it comes down as I've seen, you know, I was, I was watching the Astonish um, uh, podcast there a while back in the, and the guy from Astonish was saying it's about your people it is all about your people and you need good people they need to be aligned and it's all the classic sales stuff the top to bottom bits about you know what, what's, what's your vision what's your goal and is everyone else underneath it aligned and and that was a textbook example of um, the, the the concept was superb and, and the execution just wasn't you yeah. know and it was hard and it was frustrating because you could see it you could tangibly see the opportunity um, but learned, learned a huge amount, met some incredible people, uh, wouldn't change it. And, and there's a large chunk of hindsight in this. Um, but like I say, went to Trader and they, they did it superbly. Yeah. yeah. I, t I, mean, I, I mean, a fascinating business lesson of, you know, on paper, it, yeah, yeah, we've got the content, we've got the ads, we've got the clients, stick it online, it should work. And then, it, you know, the execution falls about absolutely fascinating, absolutely fascinating. If anybody wants to watch the uh, Astonish um, episode that you've mentioned. I'll put it in the show notes so they can they can see that. So Fish Four didn't go as planned. You ended up back on Auto Trader, general manager in Yorkshire. What what was that role and 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 how did that develop you? Uh, how did it? Well, so a couple of parts to that role. Um, ended up in Yorkshire because Fish Four had an office up in Yorkshire as well. So I was travelling up and down between Leeds and, and London. Um, and whilst at Fish Four, I'd, I'd met my, uh, my future partner, um, and she was a Yorkshire girl. So, um, so she regrets to this day joining Fish Four, <laughs> but we, so ended up in Yorkshire and, um, got a call from trader saying, listen, I hear you're back in Yorkshire. Uh, the auto trader head offices was conveniently about a five minute walk from my flat in Leeds. Um, so went back, joined, joined trader, um, big, um, the people that recruited me were um, people I worked with previously, tremendous amount of respect for, uh, joined their business after about two weeks, three weeks, maybe realized um, that what I'd been, uh, what I'd been recruited for and what the reality was that was staring me in the face were very, very different. And basically I was there to um, manage the decline of the office with a view to closing that that particular office, which I think had about 250 people working for it at the time. And this was as part of uh, Auto Traders' uh, excellent strategy of centralization um, and, and a shift to a digital first model, um, which then, you know, uh, sort of rapidly translated into a, a mobile first model a few years after that, which, and because of what Trader did at this stage, they were very well placed towards that. So in a sort of quick quick summary in in simple terms if you've got a print magazine you move it to an online operation if you take 20 percent of the revenues with you you're doing well yeah and then if you move that solely to a mobile operation if you take 20 percent of those revenues you're doing pretty well so 
Auto Trader, so you've got Yorkshire Auto Trader, you've got 250 people. They're putting out these these print mags, as are very successful 13 auto traders, I think it was, across the country at the time. And Auto Trader had the foresight to go, right, this isn't what the future looks like, you know, and we, we're making good money now. You started to see a few people chip away, some different online products uh, was, were starting to come up. Um, and they then made the decision of, we are actually going to close down profitable magazines as part of a shift to a purely online offering. Now they planned that over a period of time. Where they did a very good job is they recognized that to get the competition internally, they generated digital sales teams internally who were selling and would be selling digital products to our internal clients. So you have print and digital people working with the same uh, with the same client. So that increased that competition. So the digital guys are going out there to increase the knowledge of the internet. Um, but if if it's all right, I'll just uh, okay just to give a quick example of what Trader did specifically brilliantly. Is that is that cool? Sure, yeah, far okay. away, far away. Obviously, um, anyone selling, and we go back to TNT and understanding what you're selling in in our world, you're selling your audience. Yeah, so you've got your audience numbers, and you've got how much that that audience engages with your product. Yeah, super important. As as any influencer claiming a couple of million uh, followers will tell you, if they don't actually do anything that generates any income for them, then it, it's no good. So. Auto Trader realized uh, two things is that they had a really good audience and they needed to maintain that that audience and, and the relationship with that audience. They also realized that car dealers uh, and car sellers by and large didn't really understand what was going on with the, the Internet. Yeah. All they wanted was either a print or digital version of someone turning up on their fork or on a Thursday morning or whatever time saying, hello, I've seen that car on Auto Trader and I'd like you to take my money, please. Yep, that's that's what they want. So Auto Trader did a couple of really smart things. They focused on owning the process of getting your car off your forecourt onto the internet. The process of doing that. Yep. So they, they had a, I'm trying to remember. I think it was called Dealer Edit, but basically it was the software that enabled car dealers who were used to taking photographs of their cars and someone from Auto Trader coming and collecting that and say, sending it off to a very manual process. So they helped them. They gave them the tools to be able to photograph their cars and get them online. Okay. So once you've got that embedded with somebody, they don't want to speak to any other person that comes along and tells you, no, 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 you need to use this software and this software. They just wanted to do it once and have it done right. Yep. So Auto Trader owned that process and they owned it really well. Hello, Mr. Dealer. This is dead simple. You do this, you do this. And guess what, Mr. Dealer? At the moment, you're paying Auto Trader a thousand pounds a week. So you're still going to pay a thousand pounds a week. It's just that 900 quid of that will go on the magazine and a hundred pound of it will go on your website products. And oh, really? I don't really understand the internet. I don't want to put it on that. Well, don't worry about it. It's still a thousand quid a week. Over time, the attribution of that money changed. So then when someone says, you know what? I love the internet. I don't want to do print anymore. Well, that's all right because we're only paying, charging 50 quid a week on that anyway. So it's now 950 quid. So they, they manage that process. I see you smiling, Phil, because you get it. It just makes sense. Yeah. So here's the next smart thing they did. They also then said, because people said, you're going, well, I've had Exchanger Martin here and they've also want me to use their software. So then they said, don't worry, we've done a deal with Exchanger Martin. We'll send your data to them as well and we'll send it to wherever else wants your data. So they then opened up this dealer edit so they could send it to other people. Brilliant. Well done. It's nice and convenient. Um, if you're a, uh, the customer, absolutely infuriating if you're the competition of Auto Trader. Then they very helpfully provided everybody with free phone numbers to stick in their adverts. So then as a car dealer, you can tell who's calling you. And guess what? Safe in the knowledge that everyone calling you is from Auto Trader. So now you're talking about their pop. When you're putting your rates up, you're then saying, well, I, I know you don't want to pay any more money. So stop paying these other guys 400 quid a week because we've proven to you it doesn't work. So actually, yes, our rates are going up, but we can save you money by doing it. I mean, it's, it was just brilliantly simple, brilliantly well done. And it's the reason that Auto Trader are now, uh, you know, a beacon brand, billion plus one, one is it one point six two billion or whatever they they're, they're turning over now, sensational brand. So they they planned, they took bold steps, they owned that process. It was it was a be beautiful to watch. You didn't even realise at the time when you're doing it, but that is, I mean, that there is so much business learning out of that. It's you know, it's it's removing the pain point from the customer, it's owning the process. Yep. And then it's owning the market through that. It's absolutely brilliant. A couple of, I mean, there's a couple of things I want to go back to that you mentioned as well. Um, 
you talked about you were, you were brought into sort of in effect close down the, the print side of um, of Auto Trader. I assume that was Monroe House down at Bottom Town. Yes, it was. Yep, yep. Um, exactly that. Yep. It, it, it's interesting because well, Bottom Town wasn't quite as cool then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I remember. I remember. Yeah, the Green Bus mm -hmm. Station. Um, yes. It's um, you, you talked about closing down. We had I had um, Helen Oldham on uh, a while back, and she talked about basically downsizing the Yorkshire Post and the Yorkshire Evening Post and, and uh, probably around the same sort of time. How did you go about doing that downsizing? Because obviously you're dealing, you, you know, long story short, you're sitting down with lots of people and saying, sorry, mate, your job's gone. How, how, did, you, how did you do that and, and how did you manage it and what was it like? Um, that's a brilliant question. Um, it, it's, I, I make the joke and I don't make it lightly that the, the, the shift to Malaysia later in my career was easier than the shift to Leeds. <laughs> um, but the when, when I went in, I was taking over from uh, an incredible lady, Janet, who I think we've been in the business like 25 plus years. She was godmother to three or four of her staff's children. I mean, it was, you know, that's some deep rooted relationships. And all of a sudden there's some wide boy up from London who's come in and, and is, is in the office. Um, so in the things that were going for me in the first instance, I'd been with Auto Trader a long time and I'd, I'd sort of seen it, done it. Every job that they had in their business from copy collecting, you know, going out on a part time, but I'd done the lot. So that helped similar to what I said about down at TNT magazine. So a little bit sleeves up, get, in, get involved. Um, you know, that management approach had its limitations, but for these times, at least it, it, it worked and it, it stood its head. So there was a little bit of personal credibility there, there as well. Um, I had a good understanding of digital products, digital market. I'd worked for Fish4, which had been a credible, I ran Fish for Cars and I ran Fish for Homes, both of which were uh, Fish for Cars was was a credible alternative to Trader. And we had a disruptor rather than alternative, but, and we'd always had a clear strategy that a lot of people didn't like the arrogance of Auto Trader. Um, so on a customer service level, we used to win business at, at Fish4. So, um, so I also knew why they were losing business on occasion as well. So I was able to say, listen, if you guys are a little bit more like this and a bit less like that, that, that would make a difference. Um, having said that, you know, you, you can't be the friendly face of doom forever. There was a reality that was, was coming in. People could see what was happening with other groups. So what do you do? So you one, you're completely upfront with people uh, about what is happening because they can very clearly see it. Number one, um, Number two is that you then think, how do I keep this group of people focused and, and motivated and, and upbeat in what is clearly an extraordinarily worrying time for them? Because now I think sometimes people are a little bit more used to flipping between jobs. But, you know, back in the day when people would be in the same job for multiple years with the ex expectation that they would always finish up in that job, it's a huge, there's a huge amount of stress and, you know, people uh, worrying in advance and afterwards and it's a lot of disruptive chat etc so it's, it's personally it's, it's a massive uh, issue for them so one of the things I knew from within the wider group is that they were trialing lots of innovations at different places around the UK to test out different ways that trader would move forward so I put my hand up and said look you know we, we've got good experienced staff it's been a long time Yorkshire was one of the bigger titles in in the uh, in in the uk given its geographic reach um i'd like us to be a test bed for a lot of these different things that we're we're trialing so uh, which we did so we pulled in a few we had some wider people from group come in who would work work with us on some of these trials that we were that, that we were testing and had a very candid conversation with the staff that were going that was look you can turn up for interviews full of you know external interviews full of regret and bitterness and recriminations about what went on with with trader or you can turn up as this really motivated excited person who said yep yeah, this is what's happened we understand why we've been working on these things you know so part of a team that's testing this testing that and and giving an employer a real sense of wow this is someone who's you know faced a bit of adversity and has come out the other side in a real positive attitude um you know did everyone buy into it no did everyone eventually go with it? Yes. I mean, my telesales team, I think five, and I'm off the top of my head, I think it was something like five out of eight of my telesales team went off and worked for the same business. They literally went as a unit. The manager got recruited and said, do you know any staff? She says, well, as it happens, yes, I do. And, uh, and, and off they went. And we had some brilliant leaving dues. Um, one guy went into music, which is what he'd always wanted to do. 
you know, so I had a, bit, a few one-to-one -one chats about what next. And a lot of it was just, you know, just where, where do you want to be? What does good look like? This is where you are now. And it was, it was, it was personally quite draining, but it was also unbelievably rewarding. So, you know, so to answer the question, there was a lot of one-to-one -one, um, sort of what next for, for the individuals, but then also bringing a sense of purpose into the business and having some really candid upfront conversations with, with people. And, uh, you know, and, and understand it was emotional time. And sometimes, you know, people throwing their toys, stamping, throwing things around. You don't go running off to HR going, I've just been called X, Y, and Z. You know, you sit, you take them out for a coffee two hours later and go, do you feel any better now? And they're like, yeah, thanks. You know, and you just been a bit human, you know. Yeah. Um, and and it was uh, it, it was an unbelievable, unbelievable um, learning experience. Um, I thought the, the, the people of Yorkshire that I was working with were just absolutely class, absolutely class. Um, learned that there was a particular HR person from the wider group who wasn't and who was um, was being quite flippant with people about, you know, the how much anxiety they were suffering from this. So we, we dealt with that individual um, and really giving my team a sense that I was going to bat for them, you know, that I was I was there to, to do the very best I could um, under the circumstances. And uh, yeah, it was, it was it was humbling, exhilarating, hard yards and um, forever grateful for the people of Yorkshire Water Trader that I work with. Okay. Okay. I mean, you know, I've, I've recruited staff and, and, you know, when we sold the business, I had to tell all my team, they all had to go. And I think the only thing you can do is be honest upfront and do everything you can to help and support them on the next stage. 100%. And, you know, that's what I try to do. And, and that's all you can do. Yeah. And um, before we get onto the next step, I think we're at Thompson's next, aren't we? Um, before we go to Thompson's, um, I want to talk to our listeners and viewers about the Leeds Business Podcast Fair Deal. The Leeds Business Podcast Fair Deal has two sides to it. Uh, my side of the deal is every week I bring you, totally free of charge, uh, inspirational, motivational and fascinating guests like Mark, totally free of charge for you. And your side of the deal has two parts to it. Part number one, recommend this podcast to one other person you feel will get benefit from it. And part number two, leave us a review at Apple Podcasts on the Apple Podcast app and at podchaser.com. Uh, that is the Leeds Business Podcast Fair Deal. Sound like a fair deal, Mark? Sounds like a great deal to me, Phil. Okay, so um, we've decimated Auto Trader in Yorkshire. What did you <laughs> What did you do next? <laughs> um, the so with, with, within Trader, I was offered the opportunity to move in and do another role on the, on the digital side. Um, I think at the time that was my third stint with Auto Trader, having joined Left to Go Traveling and Left to Go and, and TNT Magazine and one thing or another. So I'd, I'd worked with the group on it, I think all in about 15 years with uh, with, with Auto Trader. Um, coincidentally, at the time that that was going on, I had had a recruiter stroke headhunter call, you will get in touch with me. Uh, and it turns out on behalf of Thompson uh, Directories. Um, and also at the same time, I had been talking to uh, my old MD from back in the day, Kate, who was now out working for John Badesky in Malaysia at, at Motor Trader, which when John Badesky sold Auto Trader, he set up Motor Trader, which looked very similar to Auto Trader. Uh, <laughs> but he did it out in, uh, in, in Malaysia, which we'll, we'll come on to that, obviously, in a bit. So um, so I was talking about that role. Um, uh, wife got pregnant with my first uh, child, Nula. And as a result of which didn't really want to be taking a heavily uh, pregnant partner off to uh, another country, um, not least of all because the respective grandmothers would have tracked me down and, uh, and killed me. So that, that wasn't happening. Um, so it was a bit of a perfect storm. Things were coming together, uh, coming an end at uh, Trader. Didn't want to take up another role there. And Thompson Directories came in and uh, had, a, had a chat with a, with a guy, Chris, at, uh, who was the... Uh, director recruiting there, really liked him, re really good, impressed with what they were saying. They were just um, bringing in a guy from Yellow Pages in Italy to revamp it in the in, in the UK. So I thought, yep, go on then, we'll have a look at, uh, we'll have a look at Thompson Directories. And that role was running the three centres in, in the, the north of England, so running the north of England, essentially. So they had an office in Glasgow, one in Darlington, and uh, one in Leeds. So um, over I went to Thompson Directories. Okay. And how did you get on there? What were your main learnings from being there? 
I mean, just as just as an aside, um, I worked for a very short time for for Thompson Directors' competitor, Yellow Pages, and I have to say I hated it. But that was down to me, not Yellow Pages. So, what did you learn from Thompson Directory? Um, what did I learned from Thompson Directory is I learned that their training is absolutely exceptional. Um, so, just to give you a quick idea on that, um, bearing in mind I was joining as a regional director one of a group of them so the, the senior sales positions in the in in the whole company um still had to go and do the two-week training uh onboarding they do which is in, incredibly thorough incredibly structured um you know quite old school you would have seen something similar at yale um you certainly recognized where auto trader who also were excellent trainers uh where they got a lot of their training materials from and i understand from subsequently that actually Yale got a lot of their stuff from Thompson's as well so Thompson's were really 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 leaders in that space with some excellent trainers um, everyone had to do the course I had to go I was a bit like undercover boss basically so I had to pretend I was coming in as a consultant to, to do it I think there's something like 40 of us on the training course I mean at, at the end of the first week I won't, I won't say it's like the SAS but five people just left the company they didn't they didn't survive the first week so um, so Thompson's really really good sales training excellent um well done thompson's on that um the other thing i learned from thompson's very very quickly is they um had a load of people working in there who were so old school and complacent and had obviously made great money over the years and just refused point blank to look at what was going on in the wider market they were super exposed because google was basically providing all the information they were charging for um and you know it was it, so it was it was fascinating and also when i'd been there a week and was called into a meeting where the whole management structure that i was working at were told they were going to be made redundant um i was thinking well this wasn't the best move i've ever made um but then subsequently uh, i was also told by a guy who was consultant to the new ceo uh, a guy called john tarrant brilliant guy um that i'd be staying on with him to work and, and deal with some of the uh, they basically premium accounts dealing with the, the you know twenty eight year old, but the, the, the big chunks of revenue that came into the business. Um, so we're working with those guys. Um, met a very smart guy in their data division who said, "I'm desperately trying to get someone to listen to me that data is going to be the future." But again, same thing as local press. If we've got a load of clients that we need to renew for this particular book and they need to pay, you know, twenty grand for the outside back cover. I don't really want to hear about your data. I want to hear about the 20 grand for the outside back cover. Um, so I, I, I did that for a, I was there for a period of time, met some great people, um, got, could, could absolutely see what was happening. Uh, an ex colleague of mine, Matt, that I'd worked with in uh, Fish 4, he joined the business down south and he rang me up about two weeks after he joined and said, You can see where this is going, can't you? And after I, I, <laughs> I subsequently then took up the job in, in, in Malaysia and I moved off to Malaysia and stayed in touch with a few people. But, you know, there's quite a really sad end to that is that um, a lot of really good people within that group were called to a meeting down at um, in Hampshire at the head office and they turned up in their cars for this meeting and everything else and were basically told, yeah, give us your car keys. And, uh, you know, you had these people stood in car parks with baby seats and stuff like that that had in the boot of the car being told now there's, there's no more Thompson directories. Um, the 118 guys picked it up. They use a lot of the data. Um, so there's a business that had all the data it needed to migrate into a, in, into uh, a whole range of other businesses um, and just didn't because they had so much entrenched revenue already. You know, it just didn't manage the migration. So um, some great people, great experience, great learnings. Um, I was fortunate to be able to move on to a, another fantastic role um so glad glad i did it um and you know anyone who i work with there i just wish them every success in, in the future and i've come across one or two of them and they've they're thriving ironically one of the guys that's thriving is because he sells data now as a as a result so a couple of people did a couple of people saw the light in there but uh yeah i mean that look there's you, you can't pick on thompson's yell we're in the same position loads of the low you spoke about the yorkshire um at Yorkshire Press and stuff like that earlier, and all, all all the news, all the major newspapers, you know, um, went went through that same thing, you know, and uh, just uh, just think about the people that sold Friends Reunited just before Facebook became a thing. So talk about beautiful timing, you know. So uh, there's uh, so there's, there's there's an element of it, you know, 
uh, that the, the timing is everything. And, um, and there's very human reasons why some strategies fail. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, hindsight's absolutely wonderful, but you, you can see there's a, you know, we've already, you, know you, you mentioned at least two examples of, of old school not seeing what's happening, what's coming over the hill. Um, you know, I saw yeah. it in the sector I was in. Um, you know, I was in online bingo and, and the big boys were comparatively, I mean, they're, they're doing fine now, but comparatively late to the party because mm. they had bingo halls yeah. full of people. Why should we bother about this online stuff? Which was great because it gave me an opportunity. So Absolutely. I'm not, not, not going to complain about that. Um, I'm conscious we're, we're, we're tight on time. Um, tell us about Malaysia. Give us a summary of uh, the next two things and then we'll get to intelligent. Yeah, sure. Uh, so went out to Malaysia, working for Motor Trader. Uh, John Madeski, when he sold Auto Trader, set it up. Uh, went out there, um, bearing in mind that, or oh, Sir John, who'd just made, I think, 300 million quid in 1998 from selling uh, Motor Trader, uh, Auto Trader. So he's very wealthy and he's got Reading Football Club and he's got various other bits. So naturally, he went out to Malaysia and started walking around, knocking on doors, selling advertising space to get a new magazine off the ground, which is what he did. Phenomenal. Um, so uh, went, went out there um, in uh, August, uh, sorry, October 2010 with a 10 month old child. Um, bit of a roller coaster. Uh, got diagnosed with cancer in February of that year, uh, of the following year. So that was lively at the same time as we were selling to a um, Japanese firm as well, which was fascinating. Um, I, I obviously got better. Um, Japanese firm bought the business and then um, had a brilliant time going around Asia, looking at um, opening offices in Jakarta and Singapore, and at the same time trying to buy businesses up in Thailand um, and, uh, and also over in Indonesia, uh, whilst at the same time trying to align the uh, cultural styles of a Japanese parent company with, uh, who are very structured, slow but things get done with the slightly more erratic local malaysian take on things um uh, fascinating brilliant um, amazing people unbelievable time deeply frustrating that you bear in mind we had a print magazine and we had digital rivals and as i've just outlined i knew exactly how to get <laughs> a successful migration from print to digital um, but the Japanese guys uh, were absolutely entrenched. The Japanese classified market is so different that Yahoo Japan is a different part of you know, than Yahoo uh, because they just do things so differently. Their their magazines were still like this thick. Like they were like old school yellow pages, you know. Um, so trying to explain to them what was going to happen with the digital revenues was just a, a no brainer. So it was an unbelievable time. But after four years of the, the last year and a half was pushing water uphill, and it was like guys, this you know there's i can see how this is going to go um i had a brilliant unbelievable boss still a great friend of mine now um and it, a wonderful experience wonderful before we go on to what you're doing now um we've got a new segment in uh, the leads business podcast and it's called the business surgery um i've asked listeners and viewers to send in their business problems and uh i will try and uh, give some sort of solution and, 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 and my guests will as well. Um, this week's uh, problem, if I can find it, um, was sent in by Nigel Croft. Uh, not sure what Nigel's business is, but thank you, Nigel. Nigel says, I'm currently doing my forward planning. How far in advance should I do my strategy? Now, that's a really good question, actually. Um, I'll answer first, then Mark, Mark can give his answer. Um, when I work with my clients, I always start with asking them the question, what does perfect look like in a year's time? And then work with them. I've got a, I've got a five step process, which I call the Fraser five step. Um, just so childishly, I can write FFS in, in lots of emails and snigger. Um, and, <laughs> that that, <laughs> <laughs> um, and that takes that takes clients through a five step process to put a one year strategy together. And the reason I do one year is because things I mean, you know, Mark's a perfect example of this. Um, things change so much over even you know, three months, six months, a year that I think anything further. Um, yes, have a, you know, have a BHAG in place, have a, a, you know, a big, hairy, audacious goal to aim at that you vaguely know where you're going. But I think anything over a year um, is probably a bit too far. Having said that, um, 
by the time this episode comes out, I will have spoken to um, uh, James Kempley from Troy Foods, who uh, is talking about a five-year plan because he's got big investment and, and big expansion plans. And, and yes, if you're you know a big company with big investment needs, um, then yes, you're going to be longer. But but my answer would be a year max. Mark, what do you think? Yep, I uh, com- completely agree. Um, I'll, I'll name check uh, Gary from uh, from Tendo, uh, Gary King. I didn't see him talking about this and saying about people with five year plans. It's like there's very few businesses that you can actually you know d- do that for realistically. Um, I, I agree with a year. I tend to take the view that businesses like you know it's. it's often like trying to build a hand uh, house on sand you know there's always this shift in sands you need a few steel rods it, driven through that you can hang on to and say this is what we're about you know and and build a, a 12 month plan around that at, at the end of the day you know it, a bit, all the standard stuff you know what, what's the purpose of the business what's the critical success factors look like what's your departmental purpose how do you measure those kpis and blah, blah, blah. you can flow all that things down um but you can also end up with a space where you get, you know, paralysis through analysis. And, and it's so for me, it's you've got your daily operations, do right by your people, do them well, make sure everyone in the business has got four things that they understand about what your business is about, four or five, whatever it is, but and, and get alignment behind that. You know, if it's too far in the future, if there's, you know, at what point do you start discarding things, you know, as something, oh, no, but this is a day to day issue now, but we want to do that in, in 48 months time. Well, okay, but how much, you know, where, where is it now with your short term goals? So absolutely agree. Um, have tw- 12 months and a shorter plan with everyone behind it is better than a longer plan that no one understands. Yep. I like that. I like that. There you go, Nigel. Hope that, uh, hope that answers your question. And if anybody has got a business problem they want to send into the business surgery, uh, just drop me an email, uh, phil at leadsbusinesspodcast.com and hopefully me and a future guest will solve your problem. Um, so let's get right up to date, Mark. Um, you are now MD at Intelligent. Yep. Tell us what Intelligent do and, and what your specific role is. Yep, sure. So at Intelligent, we sell businesses. Um, what does that mean? It means we put buyers and sellers together. Um, I'm the MD, so uh, operationally, I'm very, very hands-on day state, usual MD stuff. You know, what does the future look like? What does the here and now look like? What do we need to fix now to get to the future? Um, but I'm, I'm very hands-on, spend a lot of time with, um, with, with clients. Um, I'm actively selling, I'm actively servicing, I'm actively speaking to buyers and sellers on a, on a day-to-day basis. Um, I do that both professionally, I do it personally. I mentor some smaller businesses outside of work as well. I'm genuinely very passionate about this particular space. Um, intelligent, we're Yorkshire based, um, national coverage. Um, we work in the, you know, I, I call it, you know, people say, what, what do you do? Because obviously that we are distinct from the MA space. Let's be very, very clear about that. Our businesses are 50 grand turnover, startups during COVID selling blue widgets and now the spare room's full of blue widgets and so is the shed and they've got to get rid of the business before they lose their partner, up to about 10, 15 million turnover that you'd probably describe as big, small businesses. You know, the, the only reason they're doing 15 million now versus 3 million next number of years ago is they used to do just serve Yorkshire only and now they're in Lincolnshire and Cumbria and God forbid, Lancashire as well over the Pennines. So, um, you know, but essentially, you know, Jenny's still running the shop floor, Johnny's still running the accounts, and it's the same people, often family firms. If Mike Ashley wants to stitch up another business and fall out with the fans, he doesn't come to Intelligent. You know, we know we know where our cutoff point is, and we know that once you get past that, you're into the M&A space and everything else. So a um, lot of our market is like the traditional marketplace backgrounds that I've come to, just with a, obviously, 20% difference, I'd say, that where, where we look to, uh, look to add value. Um, and uh, yeah, very proud of what we do. Um, you know, rated excellent trust pilot, 400, whatever it is now, 22 plus reviews, rated as excellent. We work hard to get things right for clients. Do we get it right all the time? No, everyone has a bad day. Do we make sure we fix anything? If we don't get it right, bloody right we do, you know, and we're very, very proud of what we, of what we do. Interesting. So, so it's, I'm guessing it's most of its own, own owner managed, owner operator, Yep. either coming to retirement or got new opportunity or, or, you know, had enough. Yeah, so most sales are uh, at, our, at our way, uh, our our way, our, our um, part of the market are the sales driven by a major major life event usually. So that might be retirement coming up. It might be falling out with a personal professional partner. Um, it could be the mojo's just gone. 
It could be they've had a great offer because they're in the right type of space. But generally speaking, there'll be something like that. Um, and we always, you know, make sure that we're distinguishing when someone's selling the business. Is it a planned exit or are they running away? Um, because if they're running away, uh, that's probably not very sellable. If it's, if it's a planned exit, then, yeah, we can probably help. But we'll certainly know someone that can if we can't. Yeah. Now, there's obviously the whole field of, of of selling your business is a huge one and actually what we're going to do is we're going to do a separate episode all about selling your business um so look out for that in the feed um i don't know when this issue is going to episode is going to go out i don't know when that one's going to go out but it will do um but without sort of treading on the toes of that episode um interesting you said that that most of the sales are driven by a life event so would that be that most people are not prepared to sell when they come to you and if that is the case very simply what would you recommend people do to be sales ready even though they're not selling yeah that's a really good question um it's and it, the answer is not very exciting right it's if you <laughs> if you want to sell successfully you need you need to be easy to buy yeah and the vast majority of businesses grow organically and and a bit like some of the stuff we've spoken about earlier on when on a day to day basis, you come in to run the business and so and so's not turned up for work, this supplier needs this stuff, this buyer hasn't paid, and you're dealing with all of those issues. Taking the step back and saying, Guys, I know it's chaotic here, but I'm going to sit down and document our HR processes is probably going to get you lynched by your colleagues. But the, the reality is that, you know, getting your numbers in order, absolutely cr critical. You know, know your financials. We can sell what we can evidence. So, your numbers need to be in order. Yeah. So you make sure your accounts add up, you know, things like, uh, and it's, it's just little things, but you know, contracts, you know, um, if you've got staff, the amount of businesses that have grown organically, whose staff don't have contracts. And for some reason, it seems that the logistics industry haulage seems to be particularly, uh, in our experience, um, one, one where this is an issue, but Brian's worked for him for 30 years. If I suddenly give him a contract now, he's going to crap himself and wonder why he's got a contract, you know, what's, what's going on. So, the, all, all of those types of things, just paperwork, your accounts, your contracts, you know, um, you know, where where contracts are for the service relationships and, 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 you know, not just staff relationships, you know, third party relationships as well. So it's, it's all of that kind of the admin stuff that piles up, you know, um, and getting getting your house in order in that regard, um, because at, at the end of the end of it. You can talk about people's brands. We got this, we got that. We've been trading for all these years and everything else. All great, but anyone buying the business is going to come in and do due, 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 due diligence. They are probably going to be looking to get finance raised, and if they're looking to get finance raised, they need to be able to provide a you know a financial overview of the business that they're looking to buy. So it's really boring, tedious stuff um, that nobody uh, really wants to hear about but is, is really, really important. And a, a really simple way is, is, look, I can give you a valuation for your business fairly quickly. It'll be broad strokes, okay? You can get a mortgage quote, an agreement in principle fairly quickly, but to actually get the money from the lender, you're gonna have to provide all your pay slips and all this and, and everything else. It's a bit like that selling a business. You know, you actually have to evidence where you are to, to get the exit that you're looking for. Does that make sense, yeah? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And w when we sold our business, we felt, I mean, we weren't for sale and we fell foul of that. You know, I had to pull raw data out for the last three years because we had no reporting systems and, you know, clients who haven't got contracts. And, and you know, things like, simple things like the contracts most people gave to their staff probably didn't have any reference to work from home in them. Yep. So when a, you know, when a buyer comes along and says, we're all working in the office and, you know, Mary says, well, we work from home three days a week. The buyer just goes, well, where's it say that in your contract? Well, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, so yeah, loads of, I mean, like I say, we will have, we will have a, a complete separate episode all about selling your business. So look out for that in the feed. Before we finish, um, I always ask our uh, guests to give us a how-to. So Mark, tell us what your how-to is going to be and what you're going to teach us how to do. Right. Um, well, curiously, uh, I, I, I teach you how to do it, but I won't be the one actually doing the teaching when I come out the other side of it. One of the things this links back to what you've just said, Phil, and, and very much your, your role as well, is that businesses looking, not having the right type of advice 
yeah, to, to get their house in order. So we've got a couple of things, bit of context. People will come to us and they will have an aspiration of what they want to sell the business for. And I'll say to them, where you are now is not going to get you the money you want to get. Yeah. So you, you need to grow your business in X ways. And uh, be that costs, you know, efficiencies or, or driving extra, extra revenues. Um, they don't know how to um, go about that because they've kind of hit a natural ceiling, if, if you will, in, in the business. So they're going to need some sort of external professional advice. So that, that might be mentors. It might just be legal stuff. It might be accounts. It might be tax advice. It, it could be a whole range of things. So, so our bit is, yeah, how, how should you go about looking for those advisors? So um, the, the first thing to identify out of that is, well, what do you actually need help with? And let's be clear, there are jobs within the business that the uh, person requiring the help is quite capable of doing, just doesn't like doing and doesn't want to do. Well, you don't need advice. You need an employee in that case, so, you know, or outsource it or to one of the many excellent resources that are, are available. So what sort of help do you need? Do you need to outsource or is it something specific? And then we come back to the strategic element. Someone's putting a plan together uh, and they're not sure what to do next. So um it might be that they, and this this is going to sound horribly contrived, but they might need a U fill to you know to bounce those ideas back off or, or something like that. So first of all, what do you need help on? Yeah, you got to identify that straight off the bat, okay? And then understand right once you've got that help, what are you actually expecting this person to help you with, and what outcome are, are you looking for? Okay, you know there's a cliche about consultants that they you know you a consultant will come in. Um, ask you to ask to borrow your watch, tell you what time it is, and then charge you a tenner. Yeah, in as much as they're, they're only kind of telling you stuff you sort of already know. Um, so, it, you know, and that's not fair on you or, or, or the person you're working with. So, you know, you might need to work with them to understand what those goals are and objectives. But as part of a sort of discovery call, they'll want to know what they're expected to bring to the table as well. So if you've got that, to talk about those, you know, those shifting sands, you know, getting a, a solid pole in there. So understand what it is that you're expecting from them. Um, and also understand here is that if you've got a lot of things going on, so you might be looking for a superb generalist, you know, giving across the board. It might be that actually you need something for specific tax advice or you know specific legal advice, et cetera, which we'll come on to when when we, we talk about the process of, of buying and selling. But um I was at a presentation and, and a guy, I think uh, Simon Roberts, his name is from Azits, and uh, he was asked about what one of the biggest challenges in his role. And he was saying uh, his biggest challenge is all the experts at mandownthepub.com where, you know, the people are going, yeah, but my mate said, you know, which yeah. is an absolute killer. So understand what you're, you know, what, what good looks like. Um, and once you've done that and, you, and you're actually speaking to someone, what is their individual experience? You know, what have they actually done that they're bringing to the table you know and is it theoretical have they you know so Phil, after i've seen your um, presentations um, down at the business catalyst club etc etc there's a real there's a story and a narrative and this went well and this didn't and you know so th those those examples are, are really really helpful to make sure they align with the, the individual but if you know if you're a if you're a, you know uh, if, i'll go back to the astonished thing again he, he's, he's, uh, the guy spoke about the the fact that there was no structure in the place no operating system so you know so once you got the operations sorted out it flowed in lots of different directions so great he's identified what it needs and then you know what you're going to fix brilliant so then you've um so then you can get experience to align with that so that's that's super important um the next thing on that then is is compatibility yep you know if the person you're talking to absolutely grinds your gears and anything they say positive or negative is not going to be well received and guess what it's probably not a good idea yet so um so there has to be a degree of compatibility. However, that also then brings us on to the, the final point is it's a complete waste of time doing this if you are not prepared to accept that you might have to change some things about the way you go about doing what you do in your in your business. Um, and, you know, and hand in glove with that is, is also, and guess what, you're going to pay for the privilege as well because you're dealing with professionals who actually know what they're talking about. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so be prepared to pay, be prepared to actually change and and do something different you know we all know the thing about insanity same thing different result etc etc um and, and 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 that's it you know there's good resources online so there's mentorsme.co.uk there's the association of business mentors.org that's why i mentor some uh businesses uh through as well and there are a plethora of riches in you know you see all the guys at the business catalyst club i think if i'm throwing off a few name checks 
Sally Roberts, if you want to do sales training, Sally's absolutely sensational. Yeah. Um, Gary King over at Tender. I've name checked Gary a couple of times. Um, I'm on doing something with him next week. If you want um, financial advice, Paul Grace, YBFA, absolutely brilliant guy. That, um, and I'll come on to what these guys have in common in, in a minute. Um, legally, Ison Harrison, we do a lot of work with. Uh, Ray Dolben, contract specialist, another excellent guy. But the reason all of those people have in common is they'll give you 15, 20 minutes of their time to see if they can, if they're the right people to work with you, you know, and they'll be candid and upfront about what they do, what they don't do. Um, and, and like me, they're the same. If they're not right for you, they'll point you in the direction of somebody who can help you. But circling back to the beginning, those people will help from a business sales perspective, will help your business get to a place where it's more attractive. It's a better looking business, you know, Hopefully you still want to sell it and you don't go, actually, now I've solved them my problems. This is brilliant. And I'm going to, I'm going to keep the business that that's fine, but they, they will get you to a place where you can, you'll be in a better place in the future than you are now, especially if you're working on a one year business plan, not a five year one. And, you know, and, and they've, um, and, and they'll help you, whatever your personal professional aspirations are, you'll be in a better place because you've got the right advice that's filling in the gaps that you don't have as a business owner right now, help you break through and go to that next level. That is, Mark, that's a, a, a fantastic how-to and so much of that I agree with. And I think one of the one of the key ones, and I think this is key to people who are looking for external advice, is what you said, is you have to be willing to listen. And, and this is one of the issues, you know, as business owners, at some point in our careers, we've all gone, hey, I can do better than what's out there. So there's a bit of ego in there. You've got to leave that ego alone and go, I don't know everything let me speak to somebody else who might be able to help. And as you say, yeah. somebody who has the, has the right experience, you know, they haven't just read it in a book, they haven't bought a franchise, they've been there, done that, they've had the sleepless nights and they're a specialist in, in their field. Absolutely brilliant. One final thing then, Mark, who's your shout out to? So, yes, uh, and you've got that. So we have within our business, a, a, a wider sister business, a firm called Get Audience. Um, and get audience are uh, digital marketing uh, business. There's, there's obviously lots of them about. Slight difference with uh, why we've got this business internally is that we worked with a lot of digital marketeers and felt it was a little bit formulaic after a period of time um, because they are an internal client of mine and I'm a demanding client. Um, you know, they are well used to working with SMEs and very much understanding that you, you don't, people don't want a load of jargon, they just want results, yeah. So uh, Get Audience are uh, the firm I will give a shout out to. Ollie Ratcliffe is the director there. He joined us, he's award-winning um, digital marketeer, joined us from a, a bigger agency, he's done some great campaigns in the past, um, but it's all, it's all about the nuts and bolts and, and, and what good looks like. Uh, we never get into these you know, uh, ridiculous conversations about, but look how this metric that no one really gives a monkeys about has improved. It's about what we put out at the end. So we use them for our lead generation mainly and uh, doing a fantastic job for us. So that's my shout out there is get audience, check them out. Absolutely brilliant. Thanks ever so much. You've been a brilliant guest. Uh, more than welcome, Phil. Absolutely loved it. Thanks very much for having me on. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found it interesting, inspiring and of use. To make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes, please subscribe to the show. Go on, do it now. Do it now before you go off and do something else. Thank you. Much appreciated. Oh, and don't forget our fair deal. See you next week.